morning, everyone, and um, welcome to class. Thank you all for uh, joining class this morning. Um, we'll begin with a word of prayer. So can I ask any one of our online students to please unmute your mics and lead us in prayer, please? Online students, anyone? Can I request any of our online students to unmute your mics and lead us in prayer, please? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again for this time of study, Father. We just pray that as we study your word, Lord, your word will minister to us and guide us through this particular course, Father. We pray that whatever we learn, Lord, that we'll be able to apply it in our lives, Lord, and retain what we have learned, Father. We pray for blessing upon our entire faculty and all our fellow students, Father. And uh, help us, Lord, to not only learn, but to uh, apply whatever we've learned through our course, Lord, in our lives. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sanjay. So um, on Tuesday, we um, began looking at our course Christology. Uh, we looked at what is theology. We defined theology. Uh, we defined Christology. Okay, so what is basically Christology about? What is this? Is it a study about what? Can you use the mic, please? Uh, yeah. Christology is a study about uh, Christ and his divinity and humanity, how it became one. Okay. How humanity and divinity coexisted in perfect unity in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. So Christology is a study of how divinity as God, humanity, man, how divinity and humanity coexisted in perfect unity in the person of Jesus Christ. So when we study Christology, what, uh, what will we be studying about? Christology includes the study of what? What will we be studying about in Christology? Come on, you define what Christology is. So what will we be studying in Christology. Online students, okay, the na nature and character of Christ, okay. Before we looked at lesson one last week, uh, la on Tuesday, I told you what we'll be studying in Christology. So if you looked at your notes, you would know. Can you use the mic, please? How can we a, a person be like hundred percent man and hundred percent God? Okay, so we'll be studying about the. They're trying to prove if you're saying that humanity and divinity existed in perfect unity in Jesus Christ. Then we need to prove that Jesus is God, and we have to prove that He is man. Okay, so to prove that He is God, we will. What, what will we be studying about? To prove that Jesus is God, what would we be studying about? His nature, his attributes, okay? That he is pre-existent because only God is pre-existent. So it's not that he was born in a certain time when he was, that is his incarnation, but he always existed from everlasting to everlasting from eternity past to eternity future so that is what we studied in lesson one that God, uh, jesus is pre-existent the pre-existence of christ so when we study the pre-existence of christ we are actually trying to prove that jesus is god that he has divinity he is divine okay so to prove that he is god to prove his divinity we studied the pre-existence of Christ. Okay. So to prove that Jesus is pre-existent, we looked at various scripture passages. And what is the um, scripture passage that we looked at specifically? John, John chapter, chapter 
one. one. Yes, thank you, Kofi. So John chapter one. So in John chapter one, what are um, uh, we looked at four attributes of the pre-existence of Christ. Okay. Uh, so what are the four attributes we looked at? In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. In him was life. Thank you, Lucy. So uh, we looked at how jo uh, John the Apostle introduces Jesus as the word. And the word, the Greek word for word is? Logos. Logos, yes, thank you. Logos. So how, why did John use the word Logos to introduce Jesus? Because, because it had the significance in the Jewish li lives. Yes, important thank you. Role it played. Sorry? It played an important role in the Jewish lives. Yes. So in the historical Jewish setting, uh, the word logos had a very uh, significant, um, um, uh, you know, um, uh, significant and uh, an enormous significance attached to this word, and that is why he uses logos. So when he's introducing Jesus as the logos, uh, uh, John the apostle is saying that he is not just. Uh, a guiding reason. He is not a principle of the mind, uh, in the mind, sorry. He is not an intermediary between God and the human race, but this Logos is God himself. And so to prove that Logos is God, he's, he says the word was in the beginning and the word was with God and the word was God and in him was life okay so what is the greek word for life zoe yes and what does a zoe mean eternal life yeah in some places in the new testament yes it talks about spiritual life it talks about eternal life but in some places when we look at zoe uh, like for example if you look at zoe in john chapter 14 verse 6 uh, where it says you know um, where jesus says um, you know that he um, in him was life and the life was the light of um, sorry for as a father has life in himself so he's granted the son to have life in himself so the life here is not uh, is zoe which is talking about the god kind of life the the life that god has is a life that is self-existent self-sustaining and eternal it, uh, from eternity past to eternity future okay so it is the life that god has in himself and we saw that jesus does not just have the zoe in fact he is zoe that means he is life because Jesus said i am the way the truth and the life okay so that is what we looked at and i think most of you haven't gone through your notes because i can see a total blank expression on your face so please uh, it would hardly even take 15 or 30 minutes for you all to read through what we have done we just did very little uh, hardly a page i think little more than a page so please when you come to my next class please read um what we have looked through okay so that uh, <clears throat> these are important theological truths and it's important that you read through and uh, come so that you can follow what we are going to uh, study more, okay? So we're going to continue studying about, uh, we looked at the four attributes that John declares. Um, uh, and then he, by declaring this, he's presenting that Jesus is the pre-existent God, okay? So um, we'll also look at the nature and the attributes. Now, if you're saying that Jesus is divinity, he's divine, he's God, that means he needs to have the nature and attributes of, that make God, God, right? Okay, we, we prove that he is pre-existent. Now we are going to look at the nature and the attributes that are in God. We see that in Jesus himself. So we read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. We'll read that again. So can one of you please read Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, please? Philippians uh, verse two, uh, chapter 2, 5 to 7. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ.
Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider his robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a born servant and coming in the likeness of men. Amen. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. So here we see that, you know, uh, look at some important facts in this passage. Um, now to prove that Jesus is God, one important passage is John chapter 1. Another uh, important scripture passage is Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 7. Okay, we will be studying more in detail about Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 7 uh, in the uh, in a few, next few chapters that we will be looking at. But here, a few important facts is that uh, Jesus, you know, he was in the form of God. Okay, so two important things that you can note here in this uh, scripture passage is that who being in the form of God and also equal with God. Two important things. You can underline that if you want in your Bible or in the notes. You know, who being in the form of God and also he was equal with God. Now, the Greek word for form is morphe. And form just does not just mean, uh, you know, outward appearance and outward structure. Okay. Uh, what is the form of um, a dog? You can you can explain the form of a dog, but we're not talking about the outward appearance or the outward structure, but we're talking about the very basic nature. Okay, or the basic attributes or the basic characteristics. If you look at uh, the same passage, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, the first half of uh, verse 6 in the Amplified Version. Can somebody read that? It's, in, it's there in your notes. The Amplified Bible, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Can somebody read that? Poor Haldo being essentially one with God and in the form of God, Possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God, God. Yes. So here it's saying in the form of God, but you know, it's clarifying that statement form of God saying possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God, God. The attributes or the characteristic, the nature that make God, God. So Jesus had the nature, the characteristic, the attributes that make God, God. Okay. Uh, so the word form is more than just an outward appearance or a structure. It basically refers to the basic essence or the nature and the characteristics or the attributes of God. Okay. So we see that Jesus had the nature, the attributes, the characteristic that makes God, God, and hence he is God. And so Jesus eternally existed as God. And because he is um, eternally existed as God, he is equal with God, which means, you know, when we read this verse, when it says, you know, um, do not consider it robbery to be equal with God. We're talking about God, the father. OK, so he was equal with God, the father and God, the holy a spirit. So Jesus possessed the fullness of the divine qualities, the divine nature, the divine attributes that make God, God. And hence we can prove that he is pre-existence and hence we can prove that he is divine and hence we can prove that he is God. Okay. Another scripture reference that we can talk about uh, uh, with regard to uh, Jesus' pre-existence or his self-existing nature, his nature and attributes of being God is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. So can somebody read that, please? Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Colossians 1, 17. Can anyone read that? Colossians 1, 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Yes, so here we thank you. Um, so here we see that, you know, he is before all things. Before anything even existed on the earth, he was there before everything. Okay? And in him all things consist. That means he's the one who holds everything. Just And this is the very nature and the attribute of God. 
and hence we also see that he is uh, self-existent he is not dependent on anything and he is before all things that means he is pre-existent and in him all things cons uh, cons uh, consist okay um, another reference we can look at is John chapter 8 verse 58 we're looking at various references that talk about Jesus's eternal nature or that he is pre-existent and we're trying to prove that in the Bible so we looked at Philippians chapter 2 verses um, 5 to 7 uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 17 uh, another statement uh, or verse that we can look at is John chapter 8 verse 58 but Jesus himself declares his pre-existence. Can somebody read that, please? Jesus said to I was, I, I am. Yeah, so very important statement here. Okay, Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Okay, now, um, you know, the... Jesus was here in uh, in John chapter 8 he's talking to the Jews and they were opposing him you know um, and so he says that um, you know he has uh, um, that Abraham had seen his day he's telling the Jewish Jews that Abraham has seen his day and so the Jews are so angry and they challenge him and they say hey you're not even 50 years old and uh, how can you say that you have seen Abraham Okay, it's the same chapter. This is in verse 57 of John chapter 8. And then, you know, uh, Jesus gives them a, 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 a response and he gives them a sufficient response to prove his eternity was even, uh, that he, was, he existed even before uh, Abraham. And so Jesus says, before Abraham was, you know, I am. So he says, even before Abraham was, I was. So, um, you know, he doesn't say that, you know, before Abraham was, I was, but he says, before Abraham was, I am. So, you know, uh, he's saying that, hey, it's not just before Abraham there was, I, was ex I existed, you know, I am actually the I am. So you, you look at the beautiful way Jesus chooses his words and, and he says, he doesn't just say, before Abraham was, I was. He could have said that, but he said, before Abraham was, I am. So this word, I am, had a huge uh, sig important significance in the, uh, uh, in the Jewish context, okay, in the lives of the Jews. Why did it have such an important uh, significance in the life of the Jews, this this words I am or this title I am in the Old Testament is used many times okay sister God had introduced to Moses that uh, I am as I am so yes. they know that it is God yes so you know um, yeah, the uh, Andrew says, Father God introduced himself as I am. Yes. Uh, so the first time, uh, you know, God is introducing himself, giving a name to himself is to Moses, where he says, I am who I am. Because Moses says, OK, I'm going to Egypt and, you know, I'm going to tell them the God of the Hebrews has sent me. And if Pharaoh asks me, who is this God? What do I say? And so God introduces himself or gives a name to himself as I am who I am. And we read this in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. So Jesus very, um, you know, very cleverly uses these words. And he does not just say, before Abraham was, I was. You know, he could have said that, but he said, before Abraham was, I am. Because when he's saying that I am, he's claiming this title to himself that is attributed only to God the Father. Okay, the I am, this title uh, which God designates for himself. And I am who I am, when God introduces himself, he's saying that, hey, I am the self-existing one. I am the self-existent, self-sufficient uh, one. I am God. So by introducing himself as I am, Jesus 
is designating himself to this title and he's saying i am in other words he's saying hey i am god you know so because i was i am god i was there even before abraham existed okay and i am the eternal existing one Okay, so we uh, we read this words I am in uh, Exodus chapter three verses thirteen to fourteen, where God introduces Himself to Moses as um, I am, and so this word had such a deep significance uh, to God alone. And when Jesus uses this word, you know, He's basically saying, "Hey, I am God. I am self-existent. I am pre-existent. I am the eternal uh, one. I have no beginning and no." Um, end and um, i always was i always am okay and he says i'm always has have have been and i will always be now when the jews heard this what did they what did they do what what did they do they were very very angry right because yeah. uh, this was a very solemn yeah. statement this was something that was attributed only to god and here is a man you know who's claiming himself to be god and what did they do they took stones yes they took stones and they wanted to throw it at him uh, and they wanted to stone him because it was blasphemy talking against god and um, but what happened jesus you know slowly slipped away from the uh, temple okay but this is a very important uh, statement that jesus makes declaring that he is god so when people ask you hey prove to me that in the bible or prove to me where it says that jesus is god you can use all of these scripture passages john chapter 1 okay colossians chapter 2 verses 5 to 7 uh, sorry philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 7 colossians chapter 1 verse 17 and um, john chapter 8 verse 58 very important statements okay uh, another few uh, scripture passages that we can look at where Jesus proves that he is, uh, uh, where it's proved that Jesus is pre-existent. Uh, he is a pre-existent one. He is God and we can prove that he is deity is also 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 to 4. So can somebody read that please? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 to 4. Moreover, brethren. Yes, go ahead, Lucy. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of the of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lucy. So here it's talking about uh, the references here of, uh, you know, the Israelite journey in the wilderness. Uh, so in Exodus, where God is leading his people out of Egypt through the wilderness into the promised land. Okay. And God led his people by, you know, the cloud by the day, the pillar of fire by night. God parted the Red Sea for them, Exodus chapter 14. Um, and we also see that God uh, fed them with manna and quail, um, you know, food from heaven, Exodus chapter 16. He provided them water from the rock, Exodus chapter 17. Okay, And so uh, Paul is writing here to the church at Corinth and he's saying this rock was Christ. Okay, so the, the, the one that led them through the wilderness journey was Jesus himself. Okay, so here it's again proving the pre-existence of Christ. That he did not exist when he was born into this world at a certain time, when he was born to Mary. But, you know, um, he was there even before the foundations of the world. He was there even before the beginning of this world and it was he was not just uh, he did not just exist uh, when he you know became when god became man or in his incarnation but he is pre-existed so another scripture passage is first corinthians chapter 10 verses 1 to uh, 4 and then micah chapter 5 verse 2 so can somebody read that another reference where we can look at the pre-existence of christ micah chapter 5 verse 2 
can i read ma'am sure diksha now gather yourself in troops o daughter of troops he has laid siege against us they will strike the judge of israel with the rod of the cheek are you reading micah chapter 5 verse 2 Oh, sorry, ma'am. Uh, yeah, no problem. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are little among our true sons of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Amen. Thank you, Diksha. So here, uh, the prophet Micah is prophesying about whom? Jesus and where will he be born? In Bethlehem, Ephrata. Okay, and he's saying out of Bethlehem will come a ruler. Okay, ruler in Israel, and who's going forth are from old, from everlasting. Okay, so how does this verse reveal the pre-existence of Christ? How does this verse uh, reveal to us the pre-existence of Christ? Yes, because yes, are... yes, go ahead, to get rude. Uh, because it says that uh, it's going is forth from from of old, from everlasting. Yes, thank you. So it says his going forth is from old, from everlasting so he's saying his origin okay his origin is from old okay it doesn't say just from old and stop there but it says from everlasting so what is the meaning of the word everlasting everlasting means what from everlasting to everlasting uh, no beginning and no end no beginning no end from eternity past to eternity future okay so his going forth are from old from everlasting means from eternity so it shows that jesus always existed in eternity past and hence it proves that he is pre-existent sorry so um the g was jesus born in um as the prophet micah um prophesied he was he born in bethlehem Yes, how do we prove that? Look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. Okay, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 6. So we see that, you know, the, the wise men come to Herod and they say, uh, they ask him, where is, you know, uh, where is he who was born, the king of the Jews? Because we've seen the star from the east, we've followed the star, and it's led us right up to here, we've come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, what happened to him? Sorry? He was troubled. He was very troubled, yes. And uh, so he calls all the priests and the scribes, and then he inquires of them, where is this Christ to be born? And what do the priests and scribes do? They run and go and look at all the ancient parchments and the scrolls, and they try to find the answer, and then they look at what was written or prophesied by the prophet Micah. Okay, and it says, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, you know, out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, is right. Okay, so it's talking about the same prophecy uh, um, that Micah had prophesied. Okay, so we see that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah and hence the prophet Micah when he was prophesying he was actually prophesying about Jesus Christ and he was saying that his origins are from old and from everlasting. Okay, so here we looked at uh, a few passages of scripture that prove the pre-existence of Christ. Why are we looking or trying to prove the pre-existence of Christ? By proving the pre-existence of Christ, what are we trying to prove? That he is, Jesus is God, that he is deity. Okay. Any questions? Any questions? So what are some of the chapters in the Bible that you will show or prove to people that Jesus is God? 
Philippians 2, 5 to 7. Okay, thank you, Nelson. John chapter 1, verse 1, okay? Matthew? Matthew 5, okay? John 8, 58, very important passage of scripture where Jesus himself is attributing himself to be the pre-existent one. And also Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. Okay, important to remember these scripture passages. Also, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 4. Any questions on chapter 1? Okay. No questions? I would like you all to please go through chapter 1, okay? Read through if you have any doubts next, uh, next class you can ask. Okay, so we'll continue with chapter 2. Okay, we're continuing to look at um, uh, and trying to prove that Jesus is divinity, that he is God. So the first aspect we looked at that he is, he is, to prove that he is God, he is, we're proving that he is pre-existent. Thank you. Okay, now we look to prove that he is God, we look at the, uh, we need to prove, and we also looked at his nature and attributes, that he had the nature and the attributes that make God, God. Uh, we'll also look at uh, another facet uh, to prove that Jesus uh, is God. We look at how he was equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Okay, so by proving that he is equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, we can prove that Jesus is um God, okay? And so by proving that, we are trying to prove that Jesus is not, uh, was not just born at a certain time, you know, um, and he's not just uh, 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 the Logos, he's not an intermediary between God and man, but he is God, okay? So we'll go back to the uh, scripture passages that we already looked at, we already studied, um, and we will look at the same scripture passages, and from those same scripture passages, uh, we will look at how and prove that Jesus is equal with God the Father, and then we look at how uh, he is equal with God the Holy Spirit, hence proving that he is God. Okay, so we'll go back to the scripture passage that we looked first, that is John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Okay, so from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, how can we prove that Jesus is equal with God the Father? From John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, how can we prove that he was is equal with God the Father? It says that uh, the Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So Jesus is the Word, and it says that he was with God in the beginning. Okay, he was with, thank you to get through that he was with God in the beginning. That means he was, yes, Kofi? It also says that he, the word was God. Meaning the word became flesh and then made his dwelling among man, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus was also God. Yes. Um, that's a good point to prove when you're saying that Jesus is God, but here we're looking at how can we prove from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, that, uh, you know, Jesus is equal with God. Okay, we can say that he, uh, the word was God, uh, but a more important phrase that we can look at was uh, the word was with God. Okay, so the word was with God means we're talking about with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Okay. So he was with God, okay, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. That means he had, a, he was from eternity past. He was also God, and hence we can prove that he is co-equal with God the Father, okay? So that is from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Now, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, okay? From this verse, how can we prove that Jesus is equal with God the Father? Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7. Uh, Andrew also says, verse 3, all things were made through him. So he says, in the creation, in the beginning, Trinity existed. Yes, 
um, a good point. Thank you, Andrew. So if you want to even prove Trinity, not just looking at Genesis chapter 1, uh, we can also talk about it in uh, John chapter 1, verse 3, and hence also proving that Jesus is God. He is uh, equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He was there when creation was being created. Okay. From Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7, how can we prove that Jesus is equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit? It says here that uh, Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So it says that uh, it shows that he's equal with God. That means he's, uh, uh, he is God. Yes. Thank you, Warren. Um, he is equal with God. Uh, Lucy says Jesus Christ was in the likeness of God. Yes. Um, uh, uh, he had the nature and the attributes of God. Okay. Um, not like of God, uh, you know, but he had, he was in the form of God, which means it talks about he had the nature and the attributes of a God. And this was, was uh, like our in-person student says, he was um, equal with God. Yes. Yeah. So um, he was equal with God, which means he shared in the nature, in the attributes, in the characteristic that God made, that God, which made God God. And also he had the glory of the deity, okay? Uh, he had the glory of God. But when he became man, what did he do? Did he have the glory of God? Yes, no? No. Why? Um. Why, did, why did he not have the glory of God? He came in the likeness of men, okay? But we say, we're saying that Jesus was fully God, fully man, 100% God, 100% man. Then why didn't he have the glory of God? If he had the glory of, of God, none of us could see him, right? None of, would be, none of us would be able to see him because you know, this verse says, God lives in unapproachable light who no man has seen and can ever see. We can't touch him, feel him, experience him, it would be, uh, incarnation would have been of no use. And that's why it says here, he did not consider it to be robbery, to be equal with God. So even though Jesus was fully God, God becoming man, he refrained from being, using some of his attributes of the nature of God, of being omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. Okay, um, and also he took on the sonship glory. How do we know this? John chapter 17, where he says, you know, Father, and I'm, I finished the work that you've given to me, now coming back to you, give me the glory that I had before the creation of the world. That is talking about the glory of deity. And he says, I will give my the glory to, that you've given to me, I will give it to those who believe in you. So he's talking about the sonship glory. We'll study this in detail uh, later on. So we see that, you know, he was equal with God, which means he had the nature and the attributes that make God God. And he also shared in the glory of the deity. Okay. But when he became man, you know, he refrained from, you know, using his glory. Otherwise, we cannot see him and experience him. Um, uh, and so incarnation would have been of no use okay and next verse that we already looked at and studied is john chapter 8 verse 58 so from this verse how can we um, say that jesus was is co-equal with god the father john chapter 8 verse Okay, so um, here is in-person student saying, uh, God introduced himself as I am, and Jesus is also introducing himself as I am. So when um, God introduces himself as I am, uh, what does the word I am mean? I am who I am. Never changing, okay? What comes to your mind when you think of this? title I am who I am. Okay, some um, 
self sufficient self existent yes thank you uh, guess get through yeah it's continuity of uh, continue of continuity everlasting okay everlasting okay there's no one like him sorry kofi yeah. all powerful all knowing okay all powerful all knowing thank you sanjay says present existing continuously okay so here when when god was introducing himself as i am he's saying i'm self existent self sufficient all sufficient eternal and unchangeable okay so when jesus was using this word he was actually uh, equaling himself to god the father who the jews knew as yahweh okay because a uh, yahweh or jehovah a lord and so jesus was saying hey i am yahweh i am god okay and hence he is proving or co-equaling himself with god the father uh, another few references that we can look at where we can see uh, jesus is co-equal with god the father is isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 can somebody read isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 please isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 for unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace amen okay so from this verse don't look at your notes from this verse how can we prove that jesus uh, this verse is talking about who yes the birth of uh, jesus okay and um, uh, how can we prove from this verse that jesus is co equal with the father or jesus is god hence proving that he is co equal with the father okay all the pro declarations about the son that um, uh, that isaiah is prophesying about lucy says everlasting father yes yeah. prince of peace prince of peace okay the mighty god mighty god yes so jesus is being ascribed to these titles of mighty god and everlasting father okay so these titles are ascribed to whom mighty god and everlasting father this yeah in this verse to in in this verse to jesus but generally to whom to, to god. god yeah to yahweh right yes to yahweh so here we see that you know it's being ascribed even to jesus okay he's being ascribed as this title that he'll be mighty god and everlasting father and so we see there is you know we can prove that jesus is co equal with god the father because this, the 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 child that is to be born or god incarnate is not just wonderful counselor prince of peace but he is a mighty god and everlasting father very important verse to prove again that jesus is um, god and so here it also reveals christ's eternal nature and his characteristic as father now when we is, when when um, this title is being ascribed to jesus as eternal father is it clashing with god the father is this title clashing with god the father is conflicting with god the father no because they are co equal okay even though they are three persons they exist in perfect unity and in perfect oneness so this titles of mighty god and everlasting father does not actually conflict with uh who we know as the first person of the trinity god the father but it's actually also revealing christ's eternal nature his characteristic as as a father as a father god okay uh, another reference where we can also prove that jesus is co equal with god the father is revelation chapter 21 verses 6 and 7 can somebody read that please and he said to me uh, it is done i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end to the thirsty i will give from the spring of the water of life without payment 
the one who conquers will have this heritage and i will be his god and he will be my son yes and here um you know who is it talking about here and he said to me it is done i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end who is saying this jesus is saying saying yes. to uh, disciple john yes he says i am the alpha and the omega okay so um uh now this title of alpha and omega is two greek words alpha and omega and what does alpha mean first okay and omega last okay uh, the first and the last so we see that you know even this title of alpha and omega was ascribed to yahweh okay to god the father or to god in the old testament look at isaiah chapter 44 verse 6 and isaiah chapter 48 verse 12 can somebody read that please thus says the lord the king of israel and his redeemer the lord of hosts i am the first and i am the last besides me there is no god yes so here um, god is speaking he says i am the redeemer the lord of hosts i am the alpha and the omega or i am the first and the last and besides me there is no god again in um, isaiah chapter 48 verse 12 what is god uh telling the people in verse 12 can somebody read that please listen to me o jacob and israel my called i am he i am the first i am also the last yes so here thank you um and amen to these scripture passages here in isaiah chapter 44 verse 6 in isaiah chapter 48 verse 12 god is ascribing himself to what are the titles what is he saying who is he saying he is not just the king of israel not just the redeemer not just that he is there is no other god beside him but he's also ascribing himself or calling himself as the first and the last okay if you read this in the greek bible it will be alpha and omega translated in english it's i am the first and the last and so when we read um revelation chapter um 21 verses 6 and 7 and revelation chapter 22 was 13 when jesus in revelation chapter 22 was 13 jesus says i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end the first and the last so jesus is ascribing another title um that is ascribed to god specifically where god himself is ascribing that title to himself other than the i am who i am or i i am title uh, god also introduces himself as i am the alpha and omega or i am the first and the um, last i am the beginning and the end and so jesus is also referring himself to this title that is ascribed only to god or to uh, yahweh and ascribing it to himself and so jesus is proving that he is god and he is uh, no you know in no intermediary being between god and man he is not a lesser being compared to god the father he is not a lesser being compared to god the holy spirit but he is equal with god uh, the father in terms of his glory nature attributes his power uh, he is equal with um, with god the uh, father okay so by declaring that he is alpha and omega jesus is saying i'm everything from beginning to end which means all history originates in him and all or everything or history culminates in him he is the origin and he is the end he is the finish he is the destination okay so this is another uh, title that we see we saw three titles uh, john chapter 8 is 58 where jesus says i am okay we also saw in isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 where jesus is attributed the title of mighty god and everlasting father and we also see that jesus is attributing himself to the title that specifically god introduces himself in uh, the old testament as uh, the first and the last and jesus says i am the alpha and omega i am the first and i am the last i am the beginning and the end okay any questions Are you all um, excited about the study? It is interesting. Yes. 
so some of the things that we've not we've read so much some so many of these scripture passages but never really thought about in detail but it's a, a good thing yes okay any questions any questions okay if there are no questions uh, we'll stop here but uh, please, when you come to my class on Tuesday, please read. It will hardly take you half an hour. These are important thing, uh, scripture passages uh, to prove. These are basic, uh, important foundational truths of our belief. And it's important for us to know it as um, uh, students who are studying the Bible or theological students. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a blessed day and a blessed and a refreshing weekend. God bless you all. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Warren.